This is Audible Bleeding, the vascular surgery podcast. We're here to help you keep your finger on the pulse. Hi, everyone. As Dr. Velasquez said, um, my name is Ross Davis. I'm one of the vascular surgeons here at Wake Forest, and Dr. Edwards and I are going to speak with you some this afternoon about renal artery disease, uh, contemporary management, and some words still on the role for open surgical reconstruction. We'll begin with a brief review of the types of renal artery pathology seen, and then spend the majority of the time discussing atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. In the category of renal artery vascular pathology, the most common disease seen would be atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Other less common etiologies would include fibromuscular dysplasia, dissection, aneurysms, trauma, arteritis, and then developmental abnormalities of the middle aorta and its branches that would be most commonly seen in children. The majority of renal artery interventions are performed for atherosclerotic renovascular disease, as is demonstrated in this aortogram. In a series of 840 patients undergoing open renal artery reconstruction at this institution, 81% were for atherosclerosis, 15% for FMD, and 1% were for dissection. And then a remaining 3% were in pediatric patients with hypoplastic renal arteries, mid-aortic syndrome, or dissection. As illustrated in this aortogram, the majority of atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis occurs uh, at the ostea of the renal arteries. This osteal stenosis is often contiguous with a sheet of, of aortic plaque and is commonly associated with diffuse atherosclerosis of other major vascular beds that you're all familiar with carotids, lower extremities, coronaries, uh, mesenteric disease, uh, etc. Private muscular dysplasia, in contrast, typically affects the main renal artery and its branches away from the ostea and is more common in, in females under 50 years of age, often without those other typical stigmata of peripheral arterial disease. Ultimately, the two primary potential clinical responses to renal artery obstruction, whether by atherosclerosis or fibromuscular dysplasia or uh, any other mechanism are hypertension and ischemic nephropathy. Hypertension uh, in response to renal artery stenosis is the result of a cascade of events caused by hypoperfusion of one or both kidneys. This renal artery stenosis leads to a diminished perfusion at the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which results in a release of renin. And this diagram was probably in, in all of our text going back for years and years, but just to redemonstrate those cascades and reactions that are catalyzed. Ultimately, the release of renin through several steps leads to the activation of the renin angiotensin system and ultimately leads to the increased plasma levels of angiotensin II, which winds up being the major driver of, of some of these responses. Angiotensin II drives the vasoconstriction and blood volume expansion that lead to blood pressure elevation. The vasoconstriction is a result of both direct stimulation of angiotensin II receptors on smooth muscle and upregulation of expression of direct vasoconstrictors such as norepinephrine and endothelin-1, as well as inactivation of smooth muscle nitric oxide, so a stimulation of activators and, and inhibition of the vasodilator nitric oxide. The fluid retention uh, is felt to be a result of both uh, angiotensin-mediated resorption of water and sodium, as well as the adrenal release of aldosterone. And across the bottom of that slide, some listing of those other effects of, of this angiotensin-2 release and activation of that system. In patients with unilateral renal artery stenosis and two functioning kidneys, which I've tried to demonstrate here, a stenosis of this right renal artery and a normal uh, artery on the left, the contralateral kidney can often adapt to that renin angiotensin system response by suppressing its own system and demonstrating a sodium diuresis to deal with the volume overload. And so again, in the, in the kidney distal to the stenosis, reduced renal perfusion, activation of the renin angiotensin system, ultimately uh, release of angiotensin II and aldosterone levels driving the hypertension. The contralateral kidney remains perfused and is able to adapt to those by suppressing its uh, renin angiotensin system and generating uh, a sodium diuresis 
uh, in distinction in patients with bilateral renal artery stenosis or renal artery stenosis associated with a single functioning kidney, the capacity to adapt is, is blunted. So the entire uh, renal mass is now uh, affected by the uh, diminished perfusion. Uh, this can lead to a severe volume dependent hypertension in these patients, particularly as their sodium and water excretion is, is inhibited or impaired and their volume expansion uh, progresses. The renal hypoperfusion secondary to renovascular disease can lead to varying levels of ischemia. Initially, activation of that renin angiotensin hormonal axis occurs in an attempt to improve perfusion by increasing blood pressure and efferent arteriolar tone to maintain the layer of filtration. As these lesions progress, though, these uh, compensatory mechanisms may be inadequate and ischemia may become severe enough to impair actually the excretory function of the kidney, which is uh, termed ischemic nephropathy. The molecular and cellular mechanism for ischemic nephropathy is not completely understood. Chronic elevated levels of angiotensin II and aldosterone seem to lead to an expression of profibrotic cytokines and growth factors, ultimately leading to sclerosis of the tubules and glomerular apparatus, leading to injury and loss of, of excretory function. The presumed clinical consequence of all this include increased cardiovascular disease morbidity and mortality, secondary to those effects of hypertension and increased incidence of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. Other comorbid consequences are likely but less well understood. Now Dr. Edwards is going to speak with us a little bit about uh, some of the major clinical trials dealing with renal artery vascular pathology. Thanks, Ross. I hope everybody can hear me okay. All right. So for everybody on the call, the renal artery disease was very controversial at the beginning of my career, which tragically now most of you were probably still in elementary school at that time. But when we came out of fellowship in the early 2000s, there was a lot of controversy around who should be treated and who shouldn't. At that time, there was an absolute explosion in the application of uh, renal artery intervention, as there was an explosion in almost all endovascular intervention as vascular surgeons entered the fray, but more importantly, as cardiologists entered the fray. And there was uh, actually a medical evidence development and coverage advisory committee meeting that I was fortunate enough to be asked to attend as, as an expert for vascular surgery in 2007, where we discussed all these issues. And they actually, at that time, Medicare was not going to pay for any more renal artery intervention unless it was part of clinical trials, but industry lobbied hard against that and got it undone. But nonetheless, there were three major clinical trials. There was um, a European trial called STAR, and another European trial, and then there was CORAL, which is the Cardiovascular Outcomes for Treatment of Renal Artery and Lesions trial, which was performed in the United States and Canada. And CORAL, which was the moniker for that trial, was by far and away the most scientifically rigorous. Chris Cooper, who's a, a very intellectually honest cardiologist, who's now the dean of the medical school at Toledo, was the principal investigator, and he's just a great guy. And that was a randomized clinical trial that ultimately ended up enrolling 950 of a plan, 1,300 participants to two, a two-arm study that was looking at best medical management or best medical management plus the application of a balloon expandable stent for these renal artery lesions. The trial was co-sponsored by the National Institutes of Health and several industry partners. Some were pharmaceutical partners who made some of the blood pressure medications we were using and one was the company that was making the stents. The trial had a very rigorous definition of renal artery stenosis, which was great. And it also had an excellent best medical management arm that included the use of angiotensin receptor blockers, plus minus a diuretic. It included the use of statins and an alpha, or excuse me, a calcium channel blocker, amlodipine. And they used a reasonably modern blood pressure targets, even by today's standards, the, the initial standard was 140 over 90, unless you were diabetic or you had significant chronic kidney disease, in which case it was 130 over 80, which has become more of the standard target now in most of the blood pressure trials outside the intensive blood pressure studies. When the trial was completed, this summary just sort of is your uh, demographics, or actually I took the demographic slide out. This is the endpoint slide showing that the occurrence of the primary endpoint, which was an aggregate endpoint, 
which included death from cardiovascular or renal causes and a number of other adverse cardiovascular and renal events was essentially identical between the two arms of the study. And if you scroll down through all of the component outcomes, there were no outcomes that approached statistical significance in terms of differences between the stenting plus best medical therapy arm or the best medical therapy alone arm. This is just a life table analysis showing you the achievement of, um, this was actually event-free survival. There are a couple of these life table curves in that manuscript, but this is the event-free survival, and that's the primary event, which was that aggregate event. And again, there was no difference between the two treatment arms in occurrence of the primary outcome. Hopefully everyone's familiar with data when it's presented in this Basically, that vertical dotted line that you see under the heading of hazard ratio is essentially the line where if you are to the left of the line and your confidence intervals don't cross the line, it would indicate that stent plus best medical therapy was better. And if you were completely on the right side of the line with your confidence intervals not crossing it, then medical therapy was better. And if your confidence intervals span the two lines, then there was no indication that either was better. And as you see here, nothing in any of these uh, split outcomes or splits by gender, diabetic state, et cetera, led to a circumstance where stents appeared to be better than best medical therapy alone. Well, when this manuscript was put out by the writing group of Coral in 2014, and at a lot of subsequent meetings that we went to to present this data and give expert discussions, what emerged was the general consensus that there's no evidence of worthwhile benefit to prophylactic application of renal angioplasty and stenting. And what we would define as prophylactic is what used to be called drive-by renal stenting. In other words, you're there for an aortogram to do iliac work, or you're there to do a cardiac cath, and you do an aortogram and you see renal stenosis. There's absolutely no reason, if you did not have a really good clinical reason to go do that, to do it and then treat those lesions. Among the folks who did this trial and had renal artery disease as a big part of their research emphasis, we did believe that there are subgroups who are likely to receive benefit from angioplasty and stenting, but they certainly were not demonstrated in coral. But that was due, we believe, in large part to systematic exclusion of patients who were most likely to be most severely affected, those with rapidly declining renal function nearing dialysis, those with the most severe hypertension, some groups systematically excluded putting those patients in the trial because they felt like they ought to be treated, and there were certain exclusion criteria in the trial that kept those folks out. But most importantly, we do think that it's a pretty high bar that you have to jump over to make somebody better with renal artery disease by revascularizing them. And we think that that's because the medical therapies that are applied now with the very systematic application of suppression of the renin angiotensin axis, understanding who you give diuretics to, who you don't, giving statins to everyone, antiplatelet agents to everyone, that does a tremendous amount of good for these patients and revascularization actually does not add a whole lot except in highly selected patients. Well, who would be those patients that you would want to apply uh, therapy to? I think if you ask Chris, if you ask Tim Murphy up in Rhode Island, uh, who was one of the other investigators, or if you ask any of the other high volume renal artery surgeons in the country, I think almost all of us would say that the patients you're most likely to benefit are those who have truly uncontrollable hypertension or symptomatic hypertension. And symptomatic hypertension usually is symptomatic because it causes cardiac disturbance syndromes. Patients who have flash pulmonary edema or unstable crescendo angina hypertension that can't be controlled. Patients who are having rapidly declining renal function, especially in the presence of renal artery disease that's affecting the global renal artery mass. So that could be renal artery disease to a single kidney or bilateral disease to, we do still treat patients with aneurysms, but that has become a more controversial topic in the last couple of years, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. And we still would argue that young people and children with renovascular disease or any renin-dependent hypertension should be treated to prevent the occurrence of severe left ventricular hypertrophy and systolic and diastolic heart failure in their 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, how do we treat these patients? Ross, do you want to take back over there or do you want me to do this? You're going to go ahead. Okay. So the two main mechanisms of treatment are endovascular therapy and open surgical therapy. And if you looked at it by the numbers, I would bet endovascular therapy for renal artery lesions is applied in 95 to 99 and a half percent of cases with open surgical therapy truly representing almost a historical curiosity, but it's, it's a dying art and it's very infrequently performed. And I think there's only a handful of centers in the country that still do any significant volume of it. With that being said, open surgical techniques are still useful for a number of conditions, most commonly variant anatomy. And the most common reason is usually multiple renal arteries because these tend to be small and they don't respond They'll respond well to endovascular treatment, but they typically will not respond durable. Also still do a fair bit of open renal artery work for renal arteries with early branch points that make it difficult to deploy a stent without fear of jailing or occluding one of the major branches. Still perform open surgery for cases requiring concomitant open surgical management of aortic pathology. A lot of this work is now extra anatomic work, which is a little different, but still open renal artery work. In rare cases, we'll still do these cases for recurrent stenosis. It's usually recurrent restenosis after endovascular treatment. And then the most common reason Gabrielle and our partners are still applying this are cases that require branch level treatment, which would include FMD cases, aneurysm cases, and in a lot of cases, the congenital cases. So this slide just shows you some of these variant anatomies. You can see a case of multiple arteries in the top left photo that's there. The early branch point, which would be the top right, uh, which is a patient I think every single one in our group has operated on because he's also got wicked peripheral arterial disease. Recurrent restenosis, which would be something akin to what you could see in that middle panel on the left. And then aortic pathology and coral reef atheromas sometimes pose reasons to do this kind of work. The bottom panel on the right would show you that. And then the bottom panel on the left is just a typical string of beads appearance for the medial fibroplasia variant of fibromuscular dysplasia. Renal artery aneurysms are, are probably the most frequent uh, renal, open renal artery surgery that we're performing at our institution. And these are frequently secondary to fibromuscular dysplasia, but I must say we're seeing them more and more in patients who I'm not sure have FMD. One interesting thing is a lot of these patients are hypertensive. And when you section the artery after you remove everything, you often find these occult occlusive lesions that you can't demonstrate by either duplex or angiography. And by virtue of that, a lot of these patients, after they're repaired, have a, a very nice blood pressure response. The most frequent site to see these aneurysms is at the major branch point of the artery, which does make this a little harder than a main renal artery aneurysm repair. But it does make it a little more technically challenging, which on a thin patient is kind of fun. I told you earlier that renal artery aneurysms were controversial, and that's largely because of the size criteria. There was a paper written by our group, which Eric Wayne was the first author on, and then Peter Lawrence and the Rare Disease Consortium published very similar data with a larger number of patients called from a lot of centers. And what that has shown is that in patients who are not females of childbearing age, that these aneurysms tend to be very stable and do not enlarge. And that has led most of the larger volume groups in the country to take a minimum of a 2.5 centimeter threshold for treatment of these aneurysms in post-reproductive age women and most men. Now there's an asterisk there because I do think this is controversial. I would treat almost all of these aneurysms in a woman of reproductive age who wants to have children and I do think that there are some issues of morphology, the aneurysm, that have to be considered, even though all of these are saccular, but there are some that have characteristics where they're very eccentric and they look like they have a higher risk of rupture, but that's all anecdote. I will say that anyone who does a significant volume of this surgery will tell you that these aneurysms are usually of two variants when you get down to them, the ones that you're confident would have never ruptured because they're like a golf ball, heavily calcified, and you almost can't get the scissors through them to cut the branches off. And then there are ones where you can almost see through them and they're translucent. And that's, that's just one of those things that we have yet to figure out how to tell which is which. We'll still do congenital lesion work. That's largely confined to the centers that do pediatric renovascular disease. 
University of Michigan does a lot of these. We do as many as come in the door, but I think a lot of these kids now are being treated by cardiologists, so I'll probably get to do a lot of this revision work in a couple of years. But the middle panel there shows someone with hypoplastic bilateral main renal arteries. And this, these congenital lesions can be a multitude of conditions from a hypoplastic aorta that needs patching, the hypoplastic renal arteries, the hypoplastic renal and mesenteric arteries. Um, these can be a real challenge, but they can also be very gratifying because you can actually give someone a lifetime result. So the most durable way to treat all of these conditions is typically renal artery bypass, and that's the bulk of what we'll talk about for the remainder of the didactic portion of this talk. But there are other mechanisms uh, to treat these patients, including transaortic renal endarterectomy, which is a great operation that's very rarely applied in 2020, and combined aortic and renal replacement. For aorta renal bypasses, uh, you can do midline or transverse incisions. Largely, I make that decision based on how close to the hilum of the kidney I have to get. If you're gonna have to do work that really gets out into the hilum, the transverse incision will give you much better exposure of that, uh, but that's especially critical if you're dealing with an obese patient as opposed to a thin patient. For all of these, operations, I think that it's absolutely critical that you completely mobilize the left renal vein so that you can move it around to fully visualize the ostea of both renal arteries and get to the hilum on the left. You can use a variety of conduits depending upon what you're there to fix. If you're just doing a main artery bypass, I think prosthetic performs every bit as well as anything else and it's easy and it's right off the shelf. Vein is always a good option, and sometimes it's a little better for size match purposes. Um, that's especially helpful in treating aneurysms in adults. And I have hypogastric artery listed there, and the important distinction there that I would tell anyone who would take on this kind of work is that in young people, especially children, if you put a vein in place, that thing is going to turn into a giant aneurysm within just a couple of years because of the flow to a pediatric kidney is like an AV fistula, and the vein will act like an AV fistula and turn into something as big or bigger than your aorta if you do that. And a hypogastric artery tends to hold up a lot better and not become aneurysmal. And oftentimes, because of size, you cannot use a prosthetic bypass because these arteries are small. And if you put the hypogastric in, it's usually a good size match, and with interrupted sutures, you have to give that artery a chance to go and remodel and grow with the patient. For these bypasses, usually you can fix it in such a way that you keep all of your control in an infrarenal position so that you're not creating any renal ischemia during the creation of your proximal. I'll usually take a bite out of the aorta with an aortic punch to help my anastomosis hood open to keep it widely patent. I do know some people put those metal rings on their bypasses to help find it if you have to come back and do intervention the way they used to do coronary bypasses, but I don't usually do that. I would say that if you take on work like this, originating that bypass a little lower off of the renal than your main renal artery origin will give you a lot more geometric freedom to get your bypass out in a configuration that's less likely to kink or provide a technical problem that you have to come back and fix. For the distal anastomosis, these arteries are fragile. I would recommend using minimally traumatic clamps like KK clamps or small, lightly spring-loaded bulldogs. Depending upon what you're there for, you can do end-to-end -end or end-to-side. It doesn't really make a difference if it's occlusive pathology. Obviously, you'd want to go end-to-end -end for aneurysmal pathology. Extra anatomic bypasses, which have actually become a lot more commonly used as we debranch and prepare for these advanced endovascular aortic aneurysm procedures that are so commonly applied now. You can use any number of inflow sources that you can find access to, including the iliac arteries or the hepatic or splenic arteries. And I would say the iliacs are probably most common in today's practice. Really, the only differences between these bypasses and the aorta-renal bypasses are modifications of the exposure for your inflow artery, but otherwise the principles remain the same. For the splenic-renal bypasses, the splenorenal and the hepatic to renal bypasses, we most typically use vein for those bypasses. They're very short. In some cases with the spleen or renal, you can actually turn the artery down if you want. And I most frequently use prosthetic for ileorenals, and I think that that would be in accordance with the practices in most of the other groups in the country. 
for the renal artery aneurysms, which are a particular interest of the members of our group, uh, these branch level replacements, this is a pretty involved operation that takes a big setup, but it's a, it's a really nice technical exercise and a fun case to do. Typically stage these and perform one at a time as a lot of these patients have bilateral pathology. And for someone with ADD as bad as I have, this is way too much surgery to do at one time. Typically I'll use subcostal incisions because most of these cases involve pathology that extends out towards the hilum of the kidney. On both sides, you expose the kidney through a wide visceral mobilization to expose gerotus fascia and then open gerotus fascia to give you exposure right down to the hilum of the kidney and then trace your arteries and veins back to their source. I usually put a, a loop around the ureter, which is usually an umbilical tape and a ramel tourniquet. If you do this, make sure and leave some fat around the ureter and not devascularize its segmental blood supply. You'll get a ureteral stricture. When you get ready to actually do the, the money part of the bypass, we'll cool these kidneys with topical slush and arrest their cellular metabolism with a high potassium transplant type organ preservation solution. Um, you got to make sure when you do that, that you vent the vein and don't allow that to run through and gain systemic access or you'll have the patient arrest on the table. And that's why we clamp off the cave and divide the vein or make a venting incision in the vein on the left. Oftentimes I'll just cut through the gonadal or the adrenal with a purse string suture around it that we can tie down at the end of the case and just let the preservative solution drain out through that. For these cases, saphenous vein is the preferred conduit for adults because it tends to match up better size-wise with the branch arteries. And again, I've, I've said the word geometry a couple times, but for this case, geometric planning of the course of your bypass is critical because you're often making these fancy multiple anastomoses with your distal. And if you don't have the vein sitting the way you want it to sit, it's very easy to create a situation in which that is kinked and you don't realize it until you put the renal vein back together in front of your bypass and that's a real task to take all that back down and redo it. These are just some uh, pictures of some renal artery aneurysms we treated. This was a bilobed renal artery aneurysm. You can see the main renal artery looped with the vessel loop on the right hand, most right portion of the left picture. And then you can see the two branches emanating out of it that are looped with the small orange vessel loops. And on the the right-hand picture, you can actually see the vein graft coming out from beneath the vena cava. I usually, on the right side, will tunnel these retrocavally. And then it's come to a point where we've sewed both of those branches together and done a single anastomosis to those newly joined branches. Transaortic renal endarterectomy, again, is, as I said earlier, a procedure that is very infrequently performed in 2020. But this is an operation that can give you fantastic results for some of the more difficult pathology, like multiple small renal arteries or early branch points, where you're gonna have a hard time doing your bypass as a single bypass. You can do this through a midline or a transverse incision. I think it's easy both ways. Again, do a big transparent needle or left medial visceral mobilization to completely expose the perivisceral aorta. Again, you have to completely mobilize the left renal vein. You'll see why in the next uh, cartoon panel that shows you where we place the incision. I do a full exposure of the superior mesenteric artery and the celiac and divide the diaphragmatic tissue and all the neural tissue to prepare for clamp placement because frequently in these patients I'll clamp between the SMA and the celiac to, to cut down on global mid-gut and visceral hypoperfusion during the actual performance of the endarterectomy. But you can put a super celiac clamp on. I think that's a completely fair and good way to do this. When you do this, Dr. Dean used to like to do the version on the left where you go across and do a transverse aortotomy and extend onto both renal artery ostea. This looks easy and I find this to be much harder to get a satisfactory endpoint, but he was a master at it. I tend to perform more of the right-sided panel, which Kim Hansen was an absolute master at and taught me how to do this, where you extend the incision from basically just infralateral on the left side of the superior mesenteric artery down as far as you need to, and you do this complete sleeve endarterectomy, which produced the kind of specimens you saw at the beginning of this talk. 
once you get this out and you have to kind of avert the renal arteries to get the last little bit and make sure that you get the last adherent points of plaque without leaving a, a lifted up piece or a dissection. Once you get that part done, you just basically whip stitch this shot and you're done and out of there. One thing about all of these cases is this is not something you want to realize several hours later that you've had a technical defect because if you do, it's usually asymptomatic and then you end up with a dead kidney and you basically wasted three months of the patient's life trying to recover from this big operation. So we perform intraoperative completion duplex ultrasonography in every single one of these cases using a high frequency linear array probe like you see here and just directly apply it to the artery. You get a degree of anatomic detail with this that you can't get with any other modality. And so the images are actually critically important here where they're not in a transabdominal renal duplex. If you all do much of that in your labs and look at those images, you basically re rely completely on Doppler data because the depth of the renal arteries makes it very hard to get good anatomic information. This is like doing a carotid where you can lay it right on the artery and you get fantastic anatomic information. And we use the anatomic information more than we use the flow information because the flow information is altered by the ischemia and you'll see increased resistance, you'll see increased uh, systolic velocities, and you'll see some decreased diastolic flow. But if you're seeing a good brisk upstroke and you don't see any visible defects, we interpret that as satisfactory and usually leave without revision. Uh, we will see something that causes us to revise in about one out of 20 cases. We can stop there and take any questions that you all would have about this much material. And then Dr. Davis has got a couple of cases and I got one case that we can run through with you guys. All right, guys, you know how to do it. If you have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and start either speak up or put it down in the chat. We'll give you a couple of minutes for you to write them up. If not, we'll let them continue with the cases. Uh, yesterday, you did so good by asking questions. So, Matt, if you would just uh, read the question out loud, so that uh, since we're recording, so that we know what question is, okay? Sure. Dr. Chang has asked a question about the role for renal vein sampling, and that is a fantastic question, and it's it's in the books. And I hope they don't torture you guys with this in the room anymore in your boards. I think that they're the only role for renal vein renin sampling in our practice now in the very selected cases where we are considering nephrectomy for hypertension control. To get good renal vein renin is incredibly difficult, incredibly uncomfortable for the patient, and it's really only of any physiologic use in unilateral disease and unilateral occlusive disease. And in 2020, there is almost no unilateral occlusive disease that cannot be adequately managed with medication. But I don't think that there's much role for renal vein renins anymore, except in the case of someone who might have a small atretic kidney on one side or an occluded artery to an atretic kidney. And the question is, are they having hyperrenanemia from that kidney that we cannot get adequately suppressed and consider nephrectomy? But I tell you, I think we've done that maybe one time in the last five or six years. I think the answer to your question is there is no role. All right, if you guys have no more questions, why don't we move on with cases? And if you think of any other questions, you can go ahead and write them up while, while they're discussing cases. All right, first one up involves a 19-year-old with severe hypertension. She's on three medications, uh, has had three prior endovascular interventions, uh, is beginning to manifest significant left ventricular hypertrophy, and has a normal creatinine. What do you guys think? Where will you start? So someone has asked about the patient's carotid duplex uh, and imaging normal, no significant stenosis on either side. Okay, somebody's asking about a renal duplex that demonstrates elevated velocities on the left side, no significant increase on the right. Dr. Goldman's asked about, yes, they've been on, uh, they've tried ACE inhibitors and receptor blockers and remain hypertensive. Next question about how did the patient do after prior endovascular interventions? Uh, had a period of improvement uh, for a few months, but then began to 
and have recurrent problems with, with blood pressure. So transient improvement, but no durable resolution. One, one person has advocated for another angioplasty. Someone else has advocated for a renal stent due to a prior angioplasty. Dr. Edwards points out she's already had three angioplasty procedures with rapid recurrent symptomatic disease. People are advocating now for open repair. Uh, I agree, given she, she's 19, uh, has had three failed angioplasty procedures not gotten durable relief from that. And Ross, I would just add that I think that that's the, the right line of thought. This is a 19-year-old young woman who had had multiple treatments, and I, I would not argue that a stent is a terrible idea. The only problem is if you look at the lesion, to adequately stent it, you were going to go right out to the branches. Odds are she was going to restenose. You don't know that, but you're going right to the branches which precludes your ability to do an easy, very durable renal artery bypass. And this a 19 year old, she already had a very thick ventricle. And this is someone who's gonna get heart failure if you don't treat them. And when they're young, getting them treated, Matt Corriere, who's at Michigan now, uh, wrote a paper following up on a bunch of these patients and they all normalized all of their echocardiography findings they uh, thinned their ventricles back out. They, they, they achieved normal left ventricular mass and normalized their markers of diastolic dysfunction within months of having their hyperrenanemia taken care of surgically. All right, here's the next one, different age group, 68 year old, severe blood pressure elevations on four medications. Creatinine is elevated slightly, GFR is less than 30. Severe congestive heart failure with an ejection fraction of 30%, and has had three admissions in the last couple of months related to heart failure exacerbations. Additionally, has a large ventral hernia uh, after recent colon or after historical colon surgery. What thoughts does anybody have about how to proceed here? Okay, we've got a proposition for renal artery stenting. How would you do that? How would you get there and how would you set yourself up to, to stent that renal artery? Yeah, anyone that wants to just describe the case. I would do an aortogram with, via femoral access. I'm looking at the right renal mainly, and I would do IVIS. I agree with whoever wrote, you can do pressure measurements if you have any concerns, but in my short experience, we've never done pressure measurements, just use IVIS, and then I would stent the right renal artery. Based on the image that I see, I don't think that the left needs to be addressed. What access platform would you use? I would select, once I select the artery, I would bring a sheet, sheet up to the ostium of the artery. And so you would go, would you select the artery out with a diagnostic catheter? First, yes. Yeah. I just asked that because I'm interested in everybody's input on that because I've always found the renals are pretty short and I'm probably not as good an endovascular surgeon as a lot of you guys. And so I always used a shaped guide catheters, six French guide catheter will admit almost every stent size necessary to treat a renal artery unless you're using covered stents. But they're also uh, shaped catheters and now we have those you know, fancy deformable catheters. So I always used guide caths to engage these because I felt like it gave me much more stable access and then I could use a much more low profile and delicate wire to cross the lesion. I have done both depending on who I'm operating with. Anybody have strong feelings of what, what type of stent you would use, a bare metal or a covered stent or questions about that? So I'm seeing some folks actually advocating covered stents. I haven't treated one of these in a while, Dr. Edwards. Are you using covered stents for these? Or I would probably still use a bare metal stent. I'm typically not. I'm typically just using bare metal stents. And we've been fortunate that we've had a much lower restenosis rate than what had previously been published in most of the literature. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. I think part of it's because we don't oversize as much. We tend to size to the distal normal appearing renal and I don't try and match the postanotic dilation based on the embolization data 
paper that Jade Hiramoto published from UCSF showing that every manipulation of these liberates a lot and that and then we had some data that showed if you were oversizing at all you had a lot more embolic debris liberated and patients tended to have a lower less of a renal function response all right last one i think you were going to take them through this one sure so this is this is a case just present out of interest this is a lady that i saw earlier this year who had had known bilateral renal artery aneurysms for many years and had had her left side repaired at another academic center and it failed in the immediate post-operative period and she had a complex right renal artery aneurysm and she lived in the same locale for many years and they had basically told her that that was unreconstructable and then she moved someone down in the southeast was kind enough to send her over and I, I met her first about a year and a half ago. She had very severe hypertension, was taking three medications. Uh, she was young and when she first came, her last CT scan had been 15 months prior and her aneurysm was 3.3 centimeters at that time. And then when I repeated her CT at Wake Forest, her aneurysm was now up to four centimeters. Yeah, so this will show you guys just the the specifics around the aneurysm because this was a if it'll play i get some kind of message saying cannot play media all right well what a bummer i don't know if we want to risk having trying to display my screen we'll just stay on yours so right. what she basically had guys and ladies was an aneurysm that you can You'll be able to see a lot better in a moment of her main renal artery as it emanated beneath her vena cava that had a large branch going to the inferior portion of her kidney. And then she had a second, much larger aneurysm completely extending into the hilum of her kidney with a branch to the superior pole and one to the posterior portion of her kidney. This is just a right subcostal incision. And so her head would be at the top, her feet would be at the bottom. We've got a retractor extending out towards me on the right side. Uh, the loop that's extending towards the patient's heads around the main renal artery. And there's, you can see the big branch extending to the inferior pole. And then the one orange vessel loop that you can see is the other branch that heads to two separate branches coming out of the much larger aneurysm that you cannot see in this picture. The other blue loops are around the cave and the left renal vein, and then the blue loops towards her feet are around her iliac arteries. You couldn't see the CAT scan, but she had a very calcified aorta that was widely patent, but was not going to be particularly hospitable. We made the decision to proceed with her repair because her aneurysm had gotten so much bigger, we didn't feel we had a choice. Here you get a much better picture of the aneurysm, so the, the left-hand panel We've got the renal vein and the cava is pulled over and you can see the aneurysm with that big branch. So her kidney is towards the bottom of your screen. And then that other branch that has the two branches heading both to the superior pole and the posterior half of the kidney are identified by that orange vessel loop. We took a bypass off of her iliac artery, which you can see we've tunneled beneath her right renal vein, and it's sitting there pressurized, waiting to put everything back together at the kidney. And I think Dr. Strickland, who's on this call, did this case with me. The left-hand panel shows the two branches that were pulled up with that orange vessel loop going to the back wall of the kidney and the superior pole of the kidney, where I've sewn those together, and that's the mouth to which we're going to sew that pressurized bypass and you can see all the interrupted sutures holding that open as we sewed our bypass on and did the posterior wall and then the front and then what we did was we took that large branch that was going to the anterior pole and turned that down and sewed that into the bypass as well and you can see the completed product in the right hand panel just sort of presented that as a a better detailed real life set of pictures for aneurysms. And if anybody has any questions or would have done that differently, I'd love to, I would love to call thoughts from 
all the folks on the phone. Gabby, we could take any remaining questions if anybody has about this or anything else. All right, there's, there's here a question here. Can you read it out loud, please? I'm just wondering if there's a consensus about bare metal versus coverage stenting. I don't think there is, but what does everyone think? I, I think you can go either way. I do think that there's some data that um, covered stents may be really good for restenosis, which argues whether they would be better for primary treatment, but I have used them for restenotic lesions and had anecdotally more success than we have with cutting balloons drug-coated balloons, or just repeat angioplasty. Yeah, I know we, if we can, it seems like we often reach for a covered balloon, but if they have small vessel, small excess vessels and you don't want to use a larger sheath, then we're like, oh, well, bare metal is going to be okay. So I feel like there's not a hard and fast by any means <laughs> to use one or the other. So it just makes me wonder if I should just be using bare metal, period, because it's a smaller access and doesn't seem to, like you said, doesn't seem to make much of a difference. So I see a second question on the cold ischemia time, and those vary wildly depending upon how much work you have to do. But as long as you repeatedly flush the kidney and keep it topically cooled, we've certainly had cold ischemia times that exceed an hour with wonderful return of uh, kidney function. But I would say a typical one, Adam could weigh in, but I think our cold ischemia time for the case that we showed was under 30 minutes. Yeah, I think it was it was less than 30 minutes for that case. And then there was another question, any utility to functional ultrasound imaging for preoperative assessment of renal artery stenosis? Could you elaborate on what you mean by functional ultrasound imaging? Isn't there a high resolution renal perfusion imaging uh, with ultrasound? Not that I'm aware of. We had done some studies using what's called blood oxygen level dependent P2 imaging with MR, and it showed promise in showing kidneys that could have function that was retrievable. And it's a really long story why we stopped doing that, but that and the so-called renal resistive index, which I don't believe in, are probably the two most commonly used assessments that I'm aware of. All right, well, I think we're good. It's, uh...